Stanford University. Charlie, you've often complained that accountants are the root of much evil and also of even more folly. Um, you know, as we look at the current situation that we have in our financial markets, how much of the responsibility would you lay at the feet of the accountant profession? Well, here I'm a voice in the wilderness, but I would argue that a majority of the horrors we faced would not have happened if the accounting profession were organized properly. In other words, they have a position from which if they behaved intelligently and correctly, they could prevent a huge amount of all that's wrong with the system. And they fail utterly time after time after time. And they are way too liberal in providing the kind of accounting the financial promoters want. So in other words, they've sold out. And they do not even realize that they've sold out, which of course is a common human psychological phenomenon. You, you, you squelch by denial. So what example? What, you, what if you recognized would make you think ill of yourself or, or would interfere with your income? And so at a subconscious level, without any malevolence, the accounting profession are behaving in a way that makes, well, compared to what could reasonably be with intelligence and honor, uh, the accounting profession is a sewer. And would you give an example? Could you give an example of a particular accounting principle or practice that you think we'll take promotes derivative this trading with mark to market accounting, which degenerates into mark to model? Two firms make a big derivative trade, and the accountants on both sides show a large profit right. from they, the same trade. And they can't both be right. And they can't both be right. And both of them are following the rules to the T. Yes, and. Nobody's even bothered by the fact that it's happening. Right. It violates the, the most elemental principles of common sense. And the reason they do it is there's a demand for it from the financial promoters. I remember when interest rate swap accounting was done on a different and more conservative basis. And the Morgan Bank was the last holdout. And finally, they couldn't hold their traders and report the same kind of income other people reported, and so they threw out the sound accounting and went to the phony accounting. Uh, and they, they did, it was kind of funny at the time, it was many decades ago. And so, some of the people were kind of reluctant, but they said, we just have to go, go with the flow. So it was a huge mistake. Is this a problem that can be fixed with the accounting profession, with the accounting process, or is this something that we're oh, just going to have to live with? Oh, I think you're with? talking about a problem rooted so deeply in human nature that uh, I don't think you'll live long enough to see it. If it gets 20% fixed in the direction it should go in your remaining lifetime, you'll be a fortunate man. So how do we get there? So let's assume that we actually want to accomplish something good in this space. I don't know how space. to transform all human life into a... <laughs> We're just talking about the accountants, it, Charlie. Well, but... Accounting is a big subject, and, and there are huge forces in play, and, and the entire momentum of existing thinking and existing cu custom is in a direction which allows these terrible follies to happen, and the terrible follies have terrible consequences. What we're in now is in its triggering circumstances, it's worse than anything that's ever happened. Worse than the Great Depression. Yes. Yeah, not no. We're not 
the economy hasn't contracted as much as the Great Depression, mm -hmm. but the malfeasance and silliness it was the triggering event was way greater. So, so in other words, and more widespread in the twenties, a tiny little class of people were our financial promoters, and a tiny little class of people were the people that bought securities. This now is deep into the whole culture. It's, and it, it was way more extreme. So if sin and folly get punished, we're in for a hell of a punishment. So it's, it's a more pervasive problem, and it's also a more global problem. Yes. And do you see a chance that it does reach to a level uh, closer to the Great Depression? How bad does this get, Charlie? Well, nobody knows that because we've never done this before. Uh, it's, we have a bigger credit bubble, we have worse follies, we have a more in, interconnected global system. If we responded to this one the way people responded to the 30s, in my judgment, it would be way worse. I mean, we would have a catastrophe. And that, you can argue, gave us Hitler and World War II and a lot of things that we didn't need. I mean, it was not getting your financial integrity and the integrity of your accounting right has enormous implications for the future of mankind, and and, we, and yet very few people realize how much we screwed up. Very few people realize, even in leading law school and schools and business schools, how Enron never could have happened if they hadn't changed the accounting rules. The accounting rules. And, and what we have now is just a bigger widespread Enron. You know, I like, I like telling my students that no civilization is greater than its plumbing, and accounting is really the plumbing of the financial system. And to the extent that, that uh, the plumbing can't serve the function, the whole, the, 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 the whole edifice, really, um, in many situations, uh, is not going to work the way that it's intended. Idiot bubbles blessed, blessed by accountants are terrible for the whole civilization. It would be much better if we didn't have these idiot bubbles or at least if they were dampened very considerably. But people use the idiom, nobody wants to take the punch bowl away when everybody's having a good time at the party. But that's the you're, accountant's you're, job and that's the central banker's job and you're never popular well, doing that. Well, it's the business's job and the people who do it tend to be despised and hated and you know, not a lot of people are willing to be despised and hated and ruin their fellow creatures parties, et cetera, et cetera. The main thing you have to realize is Ben Franklin's basic idea that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. That's understated. An ounce of prevention is sometimes worth a ton of cure. Mm -hmm. And your only real chance was not to allow it to happen when they put in the options exchanges. There was like one letter saying you shouldn't do this. And Warren Buffett wrote it. Mm -hmm. And he just said, this is not doing any good for the wider civilization. We don't need this. Now, you know, and he was all alone. And, and he was totally right. When we separated banking from investment banking on the theory that investment banking had a natural proclivity to get a fair amount of knavery and folly into it, and that we wanted to protect our banks from the contagion. That was a good idea. When we created margin rules that discouraged heavy borrowing against securities just to make more money when the securities went up in value, that was a good idea. When they wanted to make the market system a better gambling casino as a side function of, of, of uh, 
unnecessary capital market with vast profits for the people who were helpers in the trade, the market makers and the brokers and so on. That created a big constituency in favor of a dumb change. And there was little Warren Buffett saying, this is a dumb idea. We're not controlling margins if you're having option exchanges. Mm -hmm. You get unlimited leverage, whatever unlimited the market will support. Unlimited leverage comes automatically with an option exchange. Of course. And then they did the derivative trading, which made the options exchange look like a benign well, event. Yeah. And so just one after another, we made these insane departures from the corrective devices we'd put in the last time we had a big trouble and that really worked quite well. The investment banks of yore, when the Mellons were running first Boston and Morgan Stanley was a very conservative place, chastened by the 30s, the investment banks were partnerships. They were totally private. The partners were dependent for their retirement on the prosperity of the firms they left behind and the customs and culture they left behind. And the places were much more responsible and honorable. The old first Boston company had as one of its early employees, or one of its employees, a good friend of mine. And when he went there in the early 50s, they cared terribly about the consequences to their clients long term from the securities they sold. That ethos by the time the year 2006 came along and pretty well disappeared. Now, you and your partner, um, uh, Warren Buffett, have for years complained uh, and warned about the dangers that you perceive in the modern derivatives markets, the uh, particularly credit derivatives. Uh, yeah. You know, also conserve. You know, also concerns about you know interest rate swaps, currency swaps, equity swaps. But your your real concern. Uh, has been about the credit derivative market. Well, the interest rate swap had enormous dangers in it, given the size it was on mm -hmm. at, and the accounting that was allowed. But the credit default thing just went to new levels of excess from something that was already uh, gross and wrong. And uh, what happened there was rather interesting in the 20s, we had the bucket shop. All right. And the bucket shop was a term of derision because these people ran a gambling parlor. They mm -hmm. didn't buy any securities. Mm -hmm. They just enabled people to make bets against the house and the house furnished little statements of how the bets went out. It was like the off-track betting Right, until, until the house lost its money and all of a sudden disappeared. Yes. Or the house made its money and all of a sudden disappeared. Either that way. That is right. But the bucket shop was regarded in retrospect at the end of the 20s as a criminal enterprise counterproductive to the nation. Derivatives trading with no central clearing brought back the bucket shop. But tell me because you could make bets without having any interest in the basic security. And so, and people did in the, in the, in the billions and billions and billions of dollars. So, so we had a system in the professions and in the regulatory agent that, that and, and, the, and some of the most eminent and most admired people in finance, including Greenspan, argued that derivatives trading in the form of the old bucket shop was a great contribution to modern economic civilization. Now the Federal Reserve is There's working... There's one word for this. It's insane. The problem that you're talking about now, Charlie, is really much bigger than just uh, GMAC or will the government step in at General Electric. Have a look at the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. It has ballooned. The Federal Reserve is today buying assets, and I think they're probably doing what's absolutely necessary in order to keep liquidity flowing in the short term. But they're buying assets today that they wouldn't even have considered looking at a year ago. 
There are over $800 billion of this stuff sitting in the Federal Reserve balance sheet right now, and that number, in my view, is much more likely to double or, or to approach $2 trillion uh, within the next 18 months than any other number that you're likely to see. Well, I think the problem is so extreme that nothing unextreme has any chance of fixing it. So Agreed. I basically applaud the people in the government that are doing these extreme things. I'm sure they're making a lot of decisions that in retrospect will be seen as mistakes. But given the human condition where they have to do extreme things under fire, I am not inclined to criticize. I, I like the fact that they are, are so willing to do things that have never been done before because believe you me, we have problems. Right. That so I've never seen before, too. So, and I like the fact, here I am a right wing Republican. I like the fact that Obama has put into the White House Larry Summers, who is a ferociously smart human being, and will try and do the right thing, even if it offends some people. I think that's a quality that we need right now. Well, you know, you, you mentioned uh, President-elect Obama, soon to be President Obama. What do you think of the job that he's doing so far, the transition team that he's put together, directions that he's pointed that he's going to try to uh, uh, take the economy in? Well, I would argue that he's given the circumstances and given the background he comes from, I would argue that he is doing very well indeed. And going back to your observation where you were supporting what the Federal Reserve is doing in terms of buying up all these assets, swelling well, its I balance sheet. I won't comment on every individual decision, but sure. extreme aggression in trying to prevent the total collapse of a system feeding on itself, I think is totally correct. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, and I think that, that both Bernanke and Summers are likely to understand that way better than most people would. And I think we're very lucky to have both of them there. Geithner, I don't know, but I have no, no feeling that, mm -hmm. that he isn't a good member of the, of the threesome. Now, as people look at the situation that's currently evolving, many people sort of see two problems. In the short term, there's a concern about deflation. Uh, we have a massive contraction of credit formation. There's deleveraging that's going on at a pace that nobody's ever experienced before. Unemployment is going to be rising very significantly. Uh, the, the destruction of wealth on the private balance sheets, unprecedented. Consumers are going to be spending less. They're going to be trying to rebuild their own balance sheet. Um, and clearly, this is a situation where the government has got to come in strong and the government has got to come in heavy. Um, do you have any views on the fiscal side of things? The government's talking now about an $850 uh, billion dollar package, the mix of fiscal stimulus, tax cuts, and the like. Not only do we have to save the financial system, in spite of our revulsion about the way many of its denizens behaved. But we also need a huge, a huge spending stimulus from the federal government. I don't regard that as all bad at all. I think there's a lot to be done in this country. Uh, I think we need a whole electricity distribution system, which is more efficient and bigger and more flexible and more perfect than we have. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, this is an opportunity to get that done. I think much can be done in, in medical care. And I think the hospitals of the country are probably about to get a vast improvement in their facilities, and I think that's all to the good. We have a whole lot of things that are worth doing. 
Obama is not talking about scooping up people and having them stand around holding shovels in the middle of some forest. I mean, he is talking about fixing infrastructure and so on. Uh, here in the city of Los Angeles where I live, the streets are a disgrace compared to the streets of Japan. Mm -hmm. Japan had so much fiscal stimulus that you can't find a pothole on a side of a mountain in Japan. But you can where, find but you can find lots of airports that nobody uses out in rural Japan. That may be, but at least they fixed all the streets yeah. and, and the trains and the, everything else. So uh, I welcome a fiscal stimulus that will 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 now, improve a lot of things. But okay. But as part of the government's response, the government of the United States and governments worldwide are printing money de facto at a rate that is absolutely unprecedented. And if, you know, we know traditionally that if you increase the supply of something, its price is going to go down. Short term, everybody's really worried about deflation. We would have been much better if we hadn't worked ourselves into this position where we have to do this. And you are right to point out that there are dangers from what we have to do. But the dangers from what we have to do are less than the dangers that would plainly come if we responded as we did to the 30s. In an ideal world of classical economics, you can say just let everybody suffer and then let it work back itself from a low level. We can't do that with a modern voting democracy. We're hooked for exactly what is happening and so are the other advanced right. nations. And sure, there are dangers and we may get some inflation, but, uh, but the kind of economic misery that gave us the rise of Adolf Hitler that we don't want, and we should skirt that danger cheerfully, accepting the, the dangers that come from the skirting. So you see the situation as being one where we're trying to manage the lesser of, men, of, of two evils, or the least of many evils, as a practical matter. And you know what I'm hearing from you, Charlie, is, is that so far, so good. It, it appears that the government is on a reasonable track. It is very reasonable to react with the extreme vigor that's been shown. In fact, I would argue in retrospect that the vigor wasn't quite enough. I would agree with you. I would argue that it was plu perfect obvious they had to save all these banks and the major investment banks so on a too. Scale, so a scale of one to ten, how big a mistake was it that they let Lehman go? I don't think that was a mistake. Interesting. I think it actually helps to have one or two go. I think you need some examples in a big mess. And, and, and you, you, but you the, just save everybody, right. no matter how awful they were. Mm -hmm. uh, that would have created just unlimited revulsion in the body politics. So I think, I think the people had to decide that some people were going to be saved and some people weren't. And I think it was correct that they decided they'd have two categories, mm -hmm. the saved and the unsaved, and right. I'm not going to quarrel with their decisions. Interesting. I probably would have let Lemon go too. Interesting. E even though the market seized up very dramatically afterwards and we had some of the most difficult short-term financial consequences of that failure? Well, we needed a total correction. Mm -hmm. A system that was evil and stupid. We didn't need all our bright engineers going into derivative trading and hedge funds and so on and so on. We had the civilization totally out of control. Well, they're not going there in the future. <laughs> and we were not going to get out of that without right. a lot of mess and contraction. And the mess and contraction was going to cause some operations to perish. 
I knew Arthur Anderson partners who were honest, decent people and who suffered terribly. In these situations, in other words, the problem of moral hazard yes. being so large that you really you can't do. have a rule that no matter how awful you are, you're right. always going to be safe. Simply because you're big enough and you're connected enough. No, you, you have to have, you have to have a loud failure. Yeah. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.